a Christian response to now. In 1986, Charles Sheldon would publish in his steps, What Would Jesus Do? That book sold more than 50 million copies. This book, perhaps the best-selling novel in the English language, produced the hugely influential What Would Jesus Do? movement, which experienced a powerful revival at the beginning of the 21st century. The, the book takes place in a small railroad town. It's Friday morning and the pastor of First Church of Raymond is working on his sermon. He's feeling anxious and wants to get done and one person after another has interrupted his day. He is working on 1 Peter, the second chapter, the 21st verse. Forever hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. He was finally making headway when the doorbell rang. He ignored it at first, but it rang again. There was a man out of work asking for help. The minister told him he did not know of any jobs. The man continued asking for help, but the minister ended it abruptly and closed the door. But a sadness came over him. He had no more interruptions and finished his sermon. And then Sunday came. On Sunday, there was good weather and lots of people showed up for church. The service was going well. The soloist sang a stirring song and the sermon touched hearts. And then a remarkable interruption. It was the man that had been at his door. Other people in the congregation had recognized him as well. I am not drunk, I am not crazy, said the man. He knew what the people were thinking, looking at how poorly dressed he was. So he continued, I lost my job 10 months ago. I've walked all over this city trying to find something. There are a good many others just like me. I sat here in the church this morning wondering if what you call following Jesus is the same as what he taught. What do you Christians mean by following the steps of Jesus? You see, I've tramped through this city for three days trying to find a job, and in all that time, I've not had a word of sympathy or comfort except for your minister who said he was sorry and hoped I would find a job somewhere. I understand you can't go out of your way to hunt jobs for people like me, but what I feel puzzled about is what do you mean when you sing I'll go with him all the way. Do you mean that you are suffering and sacrificing and trying to help others, help humanity just as Jesus did? Well, the man continued to talk and after he had finished, he passed out. Well, this event created, as you can imagine, quite a stir in the church, and it was all the people talked about for the coming week. The next Sunday, the crowd was even bigger at First Church of Raymond. The community needed a word. The pastor's sermon that morning was a struggle. He closed his Bible and stepped out of the pulpit. He shared that the man had passed away. He continued struggling, sharing how this man's presence had had a powerful impact on him, followed by his death, compelling him to ask a question he had 
never asked before. What does following Jesus mean? What the man said was a challenge to Christianity as it was practiced in his church. And then at the end of his sermon, he asked for volunteers. Volunteers, people that would be willing to pledge for one year not to do anything without first asking the question, what would Jesus do? This is where we enter the biblical text today. Moses was raised as an Egyptian with all of the privileges of the ruling class, but he knew he was an Israelite. He had been observing and taking notes. And as a young adult, one day he was out looking, he was observing, and he saw his people and how they were being treated in the streets. He saw how they were being oppressed. He saw how they were being treated bad. It was bad. It was really, really bad. And then he saw an Egyptian kicking and beating the crap out of an Israelite. And he couldn't take it anymore and he killed the Egyptian. And for sure, this is not my example of what Jesus would do but rather a prompting of a recognition that something was not right and Moses knows that. He knows in his gut something is wrong with how his people are being treated. Just like some of us are observing in our world this year, this summer, this month, that something is not right. In our gut, we feel the sense that something is wrong. Some of us feel it while we watch conventions. Others feel it as we listen to elected officials paint a narrative. National guards being called in, protesting, looting, police shootings, COVID. Is it real? Is it not real? Our economy, our world. And Moses could not look away. He could not get away from it. We are talking about when people are full of pain and grief and disbelief. And we as a nation, we are on the edge. Both the Republican convention and the Democratic convention are right to point to the seriousness of not only this election, but these times. But what do we do? What is our response? What would Jesus do? What would God do? Is there a word for God's people today? God does have a word, but first let's explore the word God has for Moses. Moses is minding his own business, or maybe he's not minding his own business since he's managing the sheep of his father-in-law. Yes, God has a word for Moses, but Moses isn't feeling the message that God has for him, even though he reveres the messenger. God uses an array of verbs, but it's the last verb that catches him, sin. God wants to get the Israelites out and he wants to send Moses to communicate the message and lead the people out. Parenting has been like a deja vu for me. As a, as a kid, I remembered that my mom would often send me to do something. And when I returned, it seemed like I had not done it to her satisfaction. And now I feel like I'm looking at her through another prism as I will often send my son to do errands. The other day we were trying to leave the house and my shoes were on the third floor because I was hiding them from the puppy who loves to eat shoes. And so I sent my son up the stairs. Never mind, he didn't really want to go in the first place. But he couldn't find the shoes. But he didn't really want to go. 
And so it is with Moses and so it is with us. God is trying to send us to the third floor and we don't really want to go and Moses doesn't want to go and we are often not excited about the jobs we get sent on. Ministry and following Christ are not always those things that we want to do. It's not those places we want to be. We don't want to answer the doorbell. Why me, says Moses? Why not someone else? What will the Israelites say when I come? Will anyone respect my leadership? No one listens to me. Lord, you have all these people to choose from and you chose me. Moses needs to understand better how he is, how he will be able to convince an entire nation of people that they should follow him in overthrowing the grip of the mightiest empire on earth. Moses was full of ambivalence and inhibitions, fears and doubts, and rightly so, and Moses is still hiding. I imagine Moses thinking, I passed. Moses basically says to God, please choose someone else. But God wasn't just sending Moses, God was with Moses, and God is still with us now. Our Christian response to what is happening in our world is to allow God to use us and send us no reservations. That said, what would Jesus do? The pastor in his step asked for volunteers in his congregation to make a pledge for a year to ask that question every day. What would Jesus do? That first week, 50 people volunteered. And those 50 stirred the town of Raymond so much that the next Sunday, when the pastor went into the fellowship hall, the entire room was full. It was scary. And it was exciting. What would Jesus do? An entire room full of people. Just what would Jesus do in this instant? What would Jesus do in Kenosha, Wisconsin? What would Jesus do on 53rd Street? What would Jesus do right in front of our church? What would Jesus do in the upcoming election? And it's not the answer that is so apparently easy or clear just by asking the question. But the question invites us to draw closer to God. The question invites us to inquire of God. The question invites us to be mindful of God's presence. The question invites us to pray. The question invites us to pray some more. The question invites us to study our Bibles. The question opens us up to the possibilities that allow God to use us and to more prophetically send, send us. There's a gospel song that says, Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say do. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way and enable me to say, my storage is empty and I am available to you. Thomas Merton once said, vocation does not come from a voice out there calling me to be something I am not. It comes from a voice in here calling me to be the person I was born to be, to fulfill the original selfhood given me at birth by God. Maybe today or for the next week, Maybe you can try that question out too. When you wake up in the morning, what would Jesus do? Throughout your day, what, what would Jesus do? In your decision making, what would Jesus do? Lord, what would you do now if you were here? And convenient or not, when we did feel like we got an answer, we would do it. 
The characters in the book, In His Steps, found it changed their lives, but it not only changed their lives, it changed their families' lives, and it changed their communities. And Moses found it not only changed his life, but it changed his family's life, and it changed the history of the Israelites. Christ left an example that we should follow in his steps. A Christian response for now. Amen.